This is Flotilla Friday for 12 November 2021. Uh, and uh, we don't have any topics listed in the, the HackMD yet. Why did you call it an ephemeral this time? I I've, that... started, I've started doing that. Um, uh, it it kind of goes back to Trove, actually. Okay. Uh, Vincent would really like to have a, a permalink to a page. Yeah. And um, kind of separately, but but similarly, David Bovel um, would be interested in, you know, a permanent. Uh, I'm working with him and Wendy Elford on uh, on um, uh, community stuff, including knowledge gardens and the wikis. It would be nice if the we're we're settling a massive wiki, but it would be nice if the the massive wikis were had a you know like uh, real real-time editing front end like hack and do. Correct. So then there's, you know, whether or not you sync it. And so I, David, David asked some, you know, my, David was smart about it. It's like, well, why don't you just leave the hack and D up there and sync it through GitHub? And I'm like, well, <laughs> there's only one person who can do that, the owner of the, the pad. Um, so that means not everybody, like if somebody comes along later and tries to play with the pad and the owner isn't around to sync it, then it's not getting synced. And anyway, I you, you kind of know that. Oh yeah. Okay. Good. I was just so I I started making a point of you know this is not the, the link that's going to stay there forever. Good. Much to my chagrin, and you know, Vincent's and and David Bubbles. Um. So last week, I I apologize at least a little bit uh, for not getting the recording up yet. Um. Uh, from last week, but last week we spoke about scope and context and things like that. I don't know if we want to pick that up more, especially without any artifacts from last week. Um, I am just today on my new Mac, my new faster Mac, I'm still moving in. So now I will be able to do things like sling videos around and transcripts around more easily and more effortlessly. I just ordered my new desktop iMac. And now my older Mac has decided I'm going to work even more slowly for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I felt like mine was doing that. Um, it's also the uh, Debug SF last meeting sounded interesting. Um, I know that uh, I know that Eric Angle went. I don't know who else. And then the December one is all lightning talks, and that looks fun too. Uh, my NFT marketplace, the one that I participate in that's not huge, but still fun, um, blew up yesterday um, when the founders like, uh, F you all, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take my ball and go home. Uh, so, <laughs> the rubber ducky is mine. <laughs> so he shot the website in the head and, uh, and put up a, a Twitter, um, the, the Twitter bio thing. He said discontinued on the, on the official Twitter thing. So it turns out since the whole thing is decentralized and on chain and in IPFS, it, it was, I don't know, a, a couple hours before somebody had up a clone and other people were going, yep, the, the, the person who set up the clone is a good person and we trust them. And so the whole thing rebooted in, you know, 12 hours or whatever. And it didn't even really go down. Um, the, the centralized um, URL went down, but everybody switched pretty quickly to other things. And there were already decentralized tools around it. So it's been an interesting kind of thing to watch. And, and it's still unfolding. It's going to take a while to unfold. Wow, cool. I, I partly like Mimics. And I partly, I, I've got like, um, uh, UI change fatigue kind of going on too. And there's always like, you know, now there's little like notes all over my, my Chrome window. Um, uh, Eric posted the Zoom, the direct Zoom link. Uh, so Jack and I have been watching the November DWeb video off of Zoom for as long as that lasts. Mm. 
Yeah, I, sorry, I don't have a ready uh, thing to, uh, to contribute at this point. Um, spent some time discussing uh, hyperknowledge model with uh, Patrick Zorusso, who's a colleague of Jack and uh, work and has been uh, one of the key authors of the uh, topic map reference model. And uh, I could say in some ways, I'm more confused about topics than I was before. <laughs> the, uh, or at least about the notion of legend more specifically. Um, and something he said that really got me thinking is I thought legends were a way to do equivalence class between key value mappings of uh, topics or, or rep different representation of topics have key value mappings. And he said, he seemed to say that the legend is used to create a key value mapping from the topic. And that really got me thinking about what kinds of, um, what kinds of data models do we have for concepts, right? I mean, obviously we do key value mapping and then we get into arrays and sets and bags and various sorts of containers. Uh, for me, claims are very critical to defining concepts. So we're speaking about propositional sentences. So that's a key ingredient. Uh, I'm trying to see about the key ingredients, right? Uh, of course, sentences, but sentences, many of them boil down to propositional claims, and some of them boil down to claims about attributes. I think not all claims boil down to attributes because there's quanti quantified claims. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to have an idea about the, uh, the basic components. There was a nice tweet recently that I think I'll try to find and repost about what are uh, the basic components of tools for thought? What are the atomic uh, components? Let me find that while other people discuss other things. I have it nearby. Oh, I have it really nearby. Good. Well, this yeah. is, I wanted to, I didn't get, I wanted to contact you separately, Mark Antoine, but I'm just going to throw this out here because from the last, call last week. I think I did jump off before y'all were done. But I, I really understand the project you're working on in some way and can appreciate the time you're taking to clarify things. But what would really help me when y'all talk about data models and data is just to create one and see what doesn't work or does work because it's, yes. it's a little too abstract now for me. I have sentences and a bunch of notebooks on mine, but I'm like, I can't, because you talk about putting something on a computer, yeah. it's going to be reified in something. <laughs> and that's going to be like made explicit to some extent. Yes. So I would like to see what, you know, even if they're dotted lines, what, you know what? Okay, boundaries okay, okay. Are, the, 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 so that's just a request. You know, no, no, it's it's a. Perfectly... It might be too, you may not want to move that fast because no, 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 no. I, I'm I'm working on it and finding it a bit difficult to do so, uh, but I'm definitely trying to do that because I I share your concern. It's like uh, it, the rubber has to hit the road. Uh, where I'm at is and and I was going to make that the topic of today's hyperknowledge uh, seminar, which I postponed to next week because I'm not ready. But I do think I'm uh, I should have by next week a beginning of a data model because I, it's no it's it's I'm working on the data model. Basically, what I have at this point is you have sentences; they are in many to many relationship to concepts. And I thought, okay, concepts are equivalent class of topics, but that's and they're not really equivalence classes because each um, each symbol exists in many concepts. So now where I'm at is, let's take the representative statement as a proxy for the concept. That's what we have anyway. And so any sentence points to either a representative statement or a fork point. That is 
a structure that says, well, this statement is ambiguous and could correspond to any one of these representative statements. And, and for each representative statement, since it's a concept, there's another construct in there that says, well, here are the more abstract concepts, plural, it can belong to, and here a statement that distinguishes it from other subclasses of this abstraction. Uh, so distinguishes it from its siblings in the abstraction. Uh, I think those are kind of the, but, but that means statements are a elementary data structure in my system, which makes sense because I'm dealing with claims and arguments. So of course, mm. statements have to be there. So, the, so basically, but a lot of that is optional. What is really vital is you need a way to show it to someone on the screen. So you need a statement that describes a concept that's vital. Uh, and so any statement can either go to a, a distinguishing statement or to a fork point that says, here are possible distinguishing statements. And the, this, uh, sorry, uh, here, sorry, here, yeah. And here, the, the, the distinguishing claims are gravy. Like, here is what uh, is a recipe for saying, well, it's this concept or that concept, but that's not vital. What is important is each concept must have a distinguishing statement. And so that's a basic data model that I have at this point, and I could make a UML of it. But well, I'd there's... like to see that. I, the one thing that just flashed in my mind when you were talking about fork points and multiples, well, it's used to like a free association, but it's more towards uh, entropy in the information space. Yes. Like, you know, the size of that accessible set of related things is like an entropy measure of this one. Yep. I, so I don't know if there's any value in using that kind of language or, you know, I, it, it, I, it it's just strikes me. No, no, I, you're absolutely right. It's a measure of the ambiguity of that statement. And uh, so that would be fun to just throw that out there. Yeah, you know. the reserve uncertainty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. more you should, I think you should really use the end to use the language you want to use. You know, they just say from this, you know, this particular statement, you know, where we are right now, we cannot distinguish among the following concepts. And here are. Here's the expression of those concepts. They're represented by another statement, and here is. And then we can tie data objects, such as key value pair uh, complex or whatever data. And we can say, this is also, and that's what Patrick made me realize. I thought, you know, the data object is um, something else, but no, it's, an, it's like a name. It's a attempt to represent the concept. And data objects can also be ambiguous because the same data object could be representing different things with the same key value pairs. And that means it's not well-defined enough, but it's a data object is not profoundly different from a name. That's something I had not realized until speaking to Patrick. Uh, but we're saying this data object can be and can be or has been more importantly, in this system, this data object is meant to represent this concept. And in this other system, this other data object is made to represent the same concept. And hence, there's a valid uh, way in which they're in uh, equivalence class. What's in the name indeed? Um, it's the names and equivalence classes. And, and, and this is what's missing in the pseudo so UML I gave you in speech is, uh, that's the, it shows the difference, but not the equivalence. I'd like to be able to say, okay, I've got my distinguishing statement. What are all the things that are used to uh, mean this? All the names or all the data structures? But that's also, it's basically the reverse relation from the function, right? It's a many to many and it's well, so I'm really life. excited because I want to get some of this uh, small appreciation I have of what you're talking into my brain. I mean, the little, the, you know, 
No, 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 no. My own gray shells. So ne 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 like. ne ne next, my promise is I'll have a UML diagram by next week. How's that? <laughs> Anything to start will be great because yep. then it's going to foster. Well, I'll have the, questions and maybe, you know, you can absolutely. point me to places to, you know, get better educated or find an answer, a better answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's where I'm at. I'm actually curious if Jack, you have reactions because you've seen that discussion between me and Patrick, and maybe I've missed something. I don't. I don't think you did. Um, Patrick and I don't see. Uh, don't see um, the legend in quite through quite the same same lens, but uh, it's similar enough that there's no disputes. Okay. I, I really realized that my understanding of legend was profoundly limited, and uh, I'm waiting for Patrick to expound more on legend. And I should well, it, it's everybody knows that you know when you get a street map, you frequently go down to the little box called a legend somewhere in the corner, and you can see what the little marks mean and whether it you know if it's thick, a thick road is it a highway or is it a dirt road, and so on and so forth. And that's the the legend in a topic map serves the same point, but you want to think the way you the way you would create a topic map for people is different than the way you would create one for say cancer or climate. Uh, so each has its own different legend, and uh, so they devise a terminology, what they call a topic map application. This is an application for people, an application for climate, a application for biomedical, or whatever. And each has its own legend. And, and the legend is simply there to define how you identify objects in this particular application and further from that, what rules my version of this application uses to test those properties? Those are the two things that you put in, in, a, in a legend for a topic map application. I, I used to think that a legend was a equality constraint, a bit like saying, you know, this and this and this are the primary keys of that table. But now I'm realizing the legend might be the whole schema. It's, it's, it's extraordinarily close to the schema, but not the totality of the schema. Um, you, 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 you are only interested in subject identity. Well, that's definitely what I got from you that I got in re that I got contradicted by Patrick. It's beyond subject identity. It is, it is about also defining the identity of pretty much all the keys that are relevant to the application and not just the identifying keys. And this is, well, this is what I got. Maybe I got it wrong because I'm still parsing well, what see, Patrick the is other saying. Keys, the other keys that are different from identity are, are not that different from identity. For example, um, <laughs> there's how do you represent um, the associations? How do you link to the associations? Um, because among the other many things that you will do in subject identity anywhere in the universe is their roles. You know, this is this is the yeah. this, this is the fellow named John Doe who happens to be the 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 parent of Susie Small, and and so now you 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 have to to say how you made that association. What you're saying is the roles in a way define relation identity as opposed to entity identity, yeah. Yeah. but it's still identity. Yes. Fair enough. I was thinking about kind of secondary characteristics, which are not relational. And, but of course you could say the secondary characteristic in the, it's also a claim, right? There, there's a claim well, that this entity has this property. If you take the wiki data, uh, every, every, property has a biography. Uh, that's, that's right. You know, in, in my legends, um, 
fundamentally everything is public. Now, in, in, in my topic maps, there's an upper typology that's constant across all app applications. And those are publicly defined as well. But um, if, if I'm going to define somebody's birth date, that's going to be in the legend. If I'm going to, if I'm and going, going into their characteristics of height, weight, and other stuff, that's still in the legend, even though I don't think that the, the, the specification demands it. Right. Um, but it's a uh, birth date could be a primary key. So that way, I'm not sure it's such a great example, but I'm thinking about hair color would not be a primary key and could be in the legend or not. Nobody would think of hair color as a primary key. Hmm. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, is there something we can point to about topic maps and legend? Mark is asking. Mm. Um, there was, uh, what is the uh, most developed topic map application again? It's on, on, to, on to, is it on to text or on to, uh... Ontopia is Ontopia, the company, uh, in, in the, the X company in, in Norway bought out Ber Bertelsmann that, um, Ain't no problem. <laughs> say again? Nothing. Sorry. But, but, not worth um, it. Just move on. Yeah, Ontopia.net, and they they as they were in their dying throes, they they put put all of their their um, they they put their entire topic map platform up at SourceForge, and I think it's now at GitHub. Um, but it was it was thought of as the Cadillac of of topic maps in its day. But remember, there's two kinds of topic maps. There's the kind that adhere strictly to the topic map data model. And then there's the kind that I build that don't. That, and that's the reference model that Patrick I, I, The reference model is an umbrella. And strictly speaking, the topic map data model is, is covered, it answers to the topic map reference model, but, but the reference model is much broader. The, the reference model expunged itself of all of the ontological commitments that are stuck in the, in the data model. What that means is you can do more things. The data model constrains highly how you can say what you need to say. It's a wonderful thing and it's used lots and lots of places but it's nowhere near, in my opinion, as powerful as what you can do otherwise. Basically, they made constraints to make it more closer to existing data models and hence more familiar, but also I think they lost some of the richness of the generic reference model and that Patrick has built and that Jack is using and that is for me a part inspiration for what I'm doing. Let me let me explain it this way. The if if you go to a graph database like Neo4j or any of the other famous graph databases, what you have is something called vertices and uh, edges, nodes and arcs. Now, if you'll go back to everybody knows about mind maps. A mind map is nodes with arcs, but the arcs aren't labeled. They're just arcs, they just connect things. Whereas the next level up in complexity is the concept map where you put labels on the arcs. So now you can say A causes B and you can actually see A as a bubble and B as a bubble and a line between the two and, and uh, actually a directed arrow and, and, uh, and, and a label calling causes. But in, in my opinion, and topic, the topic map data model implements that. In other words, it makes the, the association second-class citizens. But the association between two things is where the action is. The causes arc actually has a biography. And so therefore, it's a topic itself. And that's the, the thing that we do differently is that, that everything in a topic map that I build is in fact a topic. Um, Jack, um, 
I run into this all the time where basically there are, between any two things, there are many relations. And it, you know, that seems to be a core difficulty when it comes to these kinds of maps. And I'm just wondering if anybody's been poking at that kind of well, so realization or imaging. Tell me, tell me, let's get our, our vocabularies aligned here. What do sure. you mean? I've got, I got A and B, two objects, and you say there are many relations between them. Okay. Possibly, yes, certainly. Okay. Um, so, lemon and orange, um, they're both fruit. Um, they both might have been picked by different pickers. They both might have been packed by different packers. They both, but they both might have been shipped by different shippers. They both might have been um, advertised by different advertisers. Um, there's just this amazing amount of possible relations between any two concepts. And this seems to me to be um, incredibly interesting, but not well, but sort of let's, I, I, this, I, I, the assumption here seems to be ignored. Let, now let's keep working on our vocabularies sure. because I, I you're onto something and there's no disagreement any in any way here, except mm -hmm. the concept of a lemon and an orange. Mm -hmm. At the abstract level, may have several relations, but the relations you defined, picked by, grown by, so on, is not does not is not included because now you are talking about oranges of a different subject. They are instances of the concept of orange. So when you say concept, where are you talking? Are you talking at the abstract level, which we have no problems with? Or are you now getting more specific and say, these are the ones grown by Citrus Corporation A, and these are the ones grown by, they're a different subject. Thank you for making that differentiation. I appreciate that very much. Um, I would imagine that sticking with apples and oranges, or <laughs> actually lemons and oranges, um, there are certain chemicals that, and, and you know, biological pests, um, uh, you know, branching algorithms that create, um, you know, grow, uh, that create, you know, the structure of the trees, growing seasons. I mean, abstract things that are um, at least comparable. Uh, this lemon and this climate has this growing sea this lemon species in this climate has this growing season this lemon species in this climate has this other growing season um navel oranges are concepts as opposed to uh, valencia oranges as opposed to meyer lemons as opposed to you know different types of lemons um the speciation of, of these um and, and certainly how the um Capital flows go to lemon farmers and orange farmers differently. How Orange County was named for oranges, but there's no lemon county. There's all this abstract stuff that, I mean, I'm trying to maybe county, Orange County as a concept, certainly, you know, since I grew up there, it's like me. But, you know, maybe this instantiation of, uh, of naming um, that, uh, Hmm. Um, back to you. you. You're you're deep in the bowels of knowledge engineering, and you know what? There's no two knowledge engineers on this planet that will ever agree on anything, which is <laughs> which is why John Soa and a lot of the other you know the big names in this game sure. will argue there's no such thing as an upper ontology that umbrellas everything. An upper ontology, that's a new term for me. I, I, I enjoy that term, thank well, you. Well, so, so IEEE is famous for this thing called the SUO, Standard Upper Ontology. And it, 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 you can go into the, into the bowels of their email list and find out the warring parties on, no, that's not a this, it's a that and a blah, 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 blah. And, but for limited applications, there are clearly upper ontologies that, that a room full of engineers can agree on. But for in the main, in the main, on average, no. I don't think anybody in this group, right? What are there? Seven of us in this room right now 
And I'll bet we can find plenty of things to disagree on. And, 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 and it's going to be based on details of the way we view the world. Mm. But what it's we not... can find is ways mm -hmm. to federate us. We can understand our disagreements and we can map them together. And that gives everybody else a better picture of where we're trying to go. We're not trying to, to have a uniform consensus that satisfies everybody. There's no such thing. But we clearly should aim to understand each other where we're coming from more than anything else. And I, I strongly believe that that's the secret sauce to ending the world's problems, which is why Mark Antoine and I and some others are working on, and we're not alone, working on platforms to get people to find ways to talk to each other without getting into the gigantic pissing contests over vocabularies and worldviews and so on and so forth. Or, or, or rather, I would say, clarify the vocabulary yes. conversation so that we don't require everybody to share uh, an ontology or even an, an upper ontology, which is kind of a meta-ontology up to a point. Uh, and there, a and myth? there's a meta, meta. Oh, meta, not a, not a meta. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, upper ontologies are how you build other ontologies, but they're also debated. Like there's many upper ontologies and with different values and different pragmatics. This is not, and, 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 and I don't think it needs to be resolved. The point is not to get everybody to agree on ontology, but to agree on using, uh, on, it, it's to create tools for people to be able to, to discuss across ontological differences and say, okay, you see things this way, I see things this way, I classify them this way, but you know, we're still trying to arrive at, uh, we're still speaking about this particular apple. And uh, I, I you, certainly you, hope that I'm not, you know, acting as a disruptor. No, um, no, 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 I'm, I'm trying to no, understand. No, 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 if anything, okay. you're, 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 you're. Catalyst. You're a very strong catalyst, and cat cat catalysis is the big game. So, so if look, my first really big, big entry into six figure incomes and all of that blah 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 was a little company down in 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 Palo Alto that was going to go into what was known as the B two B business. One of the first. And their way of doing it was <clears throat> to map catalogs to buyers. So buyers will come in with their own ontology of how they buy resistors, capacitors, nursing uniforms, whatever. Catalogs don't do the same thing. They have their own ontologies. And so what we built was an upper ontology that allowed us a uniform way of being the intermediary between these other people. And that's a very limited domain and we were free to move about the universe and make whatever we declared to be an upper ontology. But it wasn't gonna work for Sears catalogs. It was only gonna work for us. And so the whole idea of an upper ontology, a uniform way of mapping things together is enormously useful but limited. It sounds like developing a micro language or a pseudo language. Um, well, and basically that applies within a certain linguistic community or pseudo linguistic community. <laughs> I don't wanna, I don't, I don't, by pseudo, I don't wanna mean fake, but, um, but this, you know, income hoc. translation problem. Yeah, ad hoc. I'm certainly, you know, supply, supply chain knowledge management is what comes up in my mind when I when I hear what you just said in terms you of just nailed it. Yeah. That's the that's that that was the point. And then it turned out to be a kind of a lively business because people's catalogs could be pinned to somebody else's purchase orders and orders executed, and we were just a little bit of friction in the middle. Well, a little bit of grease, I would say. Um, rather than well, friction. we were um, grease, but, but yeah. that's that's why they were willing to pay for the friction. Sure, yeah. Huh. Um, I had a client um, here in uh, the Bay Area, and um, it was my first experience with uh, people shifting 
rail cars full of guava concentrate, which just kind of blew my mind that that's how you make shampoo. There's you know, tons of guava concentrate, among other, you know, many, many varied and sundry um, uh, agricultural products. So thank you, Jack. I'm re I'm, I was trying to post this, but I'm uh, reminded of uh, Paul Thagard's Conceptual Revolutions book. Are you familiar with that? I'm um, very familiar with it. Yeah, I'm, I'm Mark Antoine. Um, I will seek it out and post who, it. Who, who's Cultural Revolution? Say the name again. Um, Mar um, Paul Thagard, Canadian philosopher, and his book, Conceptual Revolutions, and he basically creates this, um, uh, let's see, uh, computational theory of explanatory coherence it. to show how new theories can be judged superior to previous ones. And he takes you know, some very specific um, uh, scientific, at least, conceptual change um, situations. He doesn't take on... Um, Wordsworth and Coleridge and the Romantic movement and how that changed, you know, in, in the world of poetry to, you know, whatever conceptual revolution can be modeled in that language domain, but hey, science, you know, science. How, how, how I'm curious, uh, how does it speak uh, across, like, does it reuse, does it contest, does it support uh, Kuhn's work? Because that's the one I know. Oh best. boy. Yes. Um, uh, let me just read this review I have here. Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions familiarized the wide public with the idea of revolutions as the inevitable result of the development of normal science. It also made them seem irrational and the outcome of processes which were compared to the gestalt switches and religious conversions. The guard seeks to reinstall reason at the core of science. Um, which uh, is, interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I the recruiter site. I I think it's a question of emphasis up to a point. I suspect. I suspect because it's as in Kuhn was emphasizing the conceptual discontinuity, and Tagard is emphasizing the mechanism of articulation that well, allows you to move from one paradigm to another. Is that right? Tagard goes into that distinction for chapters. Yes. Okay. So it's very much an answer to Kuhn. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can't say I read the book within this. Sorry, record, I, 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 but... I know Kuhn intimately, but I don't know Tagard at all. Sure, so I'm, yeah, I'm trying um, to. <laughs> and obviously, you're, you're more familiar with Tagard than Kuhn, and that's fine. And it's <laughs> well, I mean, they they both were like 20 years ago. Um, I mean, even even more than that. But Kuhn, but, um, Kuhn was older, yeah. Yes, um, and, but, and, and my I also know my I also know my Fiera Ben well. Uh, history oh, of I science. Love Fiera ben. Yes. History of science um, is a bit of a of a pet uh, activity of mine. It's very weird. I missed a garden that. Uh, of course, uh, the the other historian of science I do read is uh, Latour, uh, Serre up to a point in in the French world. There's amazing stuff in history of science. Uh, anyway. And then there's feminist critique of history of science, which is another. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Ellen Fitzgeller. I am fascinated by the feminist critique of artificial intelligence and the difference between, um, you know, disembodied knowledge and embodied knowledge and embodied knowing. Um, yep. And Mary, somebody, the philosopher, a very famous uh, woman, but um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll look for another link. We, we, we went a bit far, but it is very much in on topic because this is about if you have different mind maps, how easy to is it to move from one mind map to another? And the 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 and, and that's why I'm I was I mentioned Latour, by the way. Uh, one of Latour's key recent works, which is absolutely vital, I think, is um Inquiry into modes of existence. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Inquiry into modes of existence. Uh, I'll find it. And uh, uh, he's basically, 
he's he's modes of existence that org there's a book there's a site there's a, a, a lot there um he's basically saying what we think of as epistemological modes and in, in a way and that's a very kunian way of looking at things right what uh how do you understand things are actually can be viewed as ontological modes and he's saying there's different ways of existing there's different ways of being and each way of existing indeed has its way of uh you, there are questions that define existence in that mode, and those are epistemological questions proper to that mode. Um, but each of them are existing in, in, in their own right. And what is interesting often is how single entities usually exist in multiple modes and how the entity crosses from one mode of existence to another. And it's it's never a fully transparent crossing. And actually one of his modes of existence, he calls double click. And it's this notion that there could be such a thing as a transparent crossing, that you could think of the same entity in the same way across different modes. And, and which he reviles as one of the great illusions of uh, modern thought. Uh, whereas the nature of the transformation as uh, certain things cross modes is absolutely fundamental to understand modes of existence and to understand beings. Um, oh, <laughs> Bill Anderson. So was it the, the earlier sociotechnical work or was it the modes of existence? Work? The, I can't remember the, the book. I just can't remember. It was the one where he was describing all kinds of things like automated railways on, in airports and stuff. And it was just related to some technology we were building, and I was trying to frame it for Xerox manage. You know, that really that, that, that would be the earlier was, work. I just thought I was a cuckoo guy. <laughs> it might be the earlier work. Yeah, it, it's also <laughs> very fascinating. He's very much saying, "Let's take non-human actors as actors in uh, social interaction." Uh, hey, I've, been, I've been pushing my AI friends. I said, "Yeah, well, you know, give me." Give me an intelligent machine that I can interact with, and maybe we can start. But these things you produce so far, you know. But but but, but Latour makes it very dirt. clear that non-human actors, including ones you cannot have, say, conversations with, you're still interacting with, and they're still part of your cognitive network at a certain level. I'm a uh, I'm a look. I've just been been involved with the uh, you know the. Uh, the dystopian American health system. And I have to tell you, if I meet the engineers who are writing the interfaces to these programs, oh, uh, I might I, hang I, them I, up I, by, I, their, I, by their toenails in terms of user experience. You got to be kidding me. I mean, one thing, like people are like, iSchools are funding all, like doing all this research on UX. The companies uh, producing these goddamn apps are spending as little as possible on UX. I, I, I'm not. I'm not saying Based it's my own. I know that's anecdotal, so you know whatever. <laughs> I'm not saying it's not a toxic social network, but it is a social network. <laughs> well, you know, there was a paper years, 30, 40 years ago. I can't remember the name. Uh, Stanford uh, computer scientist who basically, in his research, showed that when computers, that the relationship between people and computers. We are really happy to offload work onto the computers, but if they can't do it fast enough or there's too much friction, we'll just take it on ourselves. It was like an uh, a, uh, equilibrium of uh, effort or something. I can't remember the, uh, home is some kind of a homeostatic relationship between, but they said basically when the computers can't, people will do more, not that we want to, and the, the other thing is, uh, since I'm into my French sociologist rant, uh, a lot of things, automation often aims to reduce uncertainty. And uncertainty is absolutely vital in human interactions. And um, a lot of control of power can actually be analyzed as control of uncertainty. And that's... Uh, 
absolutely brilliant book called Lecteur et le Système by, uh, well, ah, what's their name? Anyway, I'll get, I'll get the reference. And um, the, and I, and I think that a lot of, a lot of getting things wrong in terms of UX is trying to reduce uncertainty to zero. Whereas humans needs the space of uncertainty to negotiate and find arrangements and find these and interact really. Yeah, uh, but the other piece is Don Norman's, you know, his book on Don't Make Me Think. Part of the issue that I'm having now because I'm interacting with a lot of different systems and their interfaces is like, I need some con confirmation that my model of what happens when I click this button, that that, that, that is going to be confirmed. And when that doesn't happen, I'm more like less interested in like, oh, you got another app for me? You know, I'll just delete it before I load it because, so there is some, I, I know you're right, but we are building these things and throwing them out and forcing ourselves to interact with them. You know, and just, you know, the trouble with, uh, you know, Tech yeah. people like me, my wife, my wife says, yeah, well, you're willing to sit down in front of a terminal in a computer for hours because something doesn't work. Most people, she's an anthropologist, she said, most people don't get up in the morning and go, oh boy, today I'm going to use a computer. No, they're more like, today I'm going to finish my novel or I'm going to you know, do this. They do not want to use a computer, but it's what's available for them to you know, get the bills paid. So there are a few of us who are like, oh my God, let's, woohoo, what happens when I type this, you know? <laughs> but that's, we are a very, very, very small minority of people on the planet. So I don't know. My experience is that with more, there are more confusing models. I don't have a model of what, how does this menu work? Oh, just use the hamburger menu. I'm like, what the hell are people talking about? Um, you know, I mean, uh, like, so I know what they're talking about now, but the point is because it's like a different one almost every time. Where did they put that? I can't find it's like that's how I'm spending my time. And so, uh, Bill, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, so for me, you know, that's it's just like there's more overhead for me. There's a um, book I'd like to highlight and um, even more um, suggest kind of thinking in terms of um, oh, um, progressive web apps, basically web apps that you can download on devices that are not necessarily um, installed from um, you know, the, the giant uh, marketplaces of Apple and Google, but basically from a web page. Um, which you can do with the Resilient Web Design, uh, Jeremy Keith book, I believe it is um, very pointed about um, resilient web apps, basically, you know, um, building the core of the system for people with slow browsers and uh, slow connections and old browsers, and then progressively enhancing. But I, I, this, is a, this is a work of literature and I, I want to point this out and um, kind of go, aha, here's something that's interesting, new, and beautiful that somebody did. Um, uh, hey, I want everybody to take a look at this. Um, but it also um, is kind of neat, Bill, um, that it goes into a relatively painless history of um, HTML and HTML um, centered design. Um, so. Uh, I hope it's a benefit. Um, and unfortunately, I have to go to work. I wish I could stay. But thank you. Thank you all. Um, I really um, uh, need to, again, save this uh, chat. And Pete, um, when you can get the recording, I'll listen to last week and <laughs> figure out some of the things that went by too fast. Um, in an accent I'm not completely familiar with. Sorry, I'm on a train um, But uh, we can talk fast. That's all right. Um, I'll go figure it out. Uh, good to see you all. Take care. Bye-bye. See you. Yeah, thanks for the name correction and the don't make me think. Mm.
Yeah. Uh, no worries. Yeah. Well, sorry, Let's... I went off on that rant, but just because I'm now involved with a lot of different systems, it really is annoying. Where I, there was a time when there were fewer systems, I did have a model that would more or less produce or confirm something would happen, and I could feel like it. I was confirmed in what I thought actually happened. Man. You know, at least like the ATM at the bank, as weird as it is, there's only a few things, and if you push the buttons right, the money comes out. I'm like, thank you. I have you a know? controversial counterpoint. Cool. Which is the the different designs, like web designs, um, by like you know Google and the like, really you know like basically all the Facebook apps. They have some like very common shared components and like elements. For example, like a hamburger bar or like a search box or like a little icon to click filters, which then opens up a pop up. Like there's a lot of like elements that are reused in a lots of different websites. And in some ways that's actually limiting because now everyone is used to like, you know, it, it, the like top 10 websites, whatever those websites do becomes a standard that if you try to break from that mold and do any sort of like innovative design, um, people are like, wait, this doesn't fit with my model. Like, I don't get how to use this. And so you're kind of forced as a designer to like fit in with what is the, um, the standard. And I'm not saying that that's like a bad thing entirely, but there's negatives to it because then it doesn't allow, when you need to like, it's like when you're trying to, you know, um, visualize a, a network map, that's like a really difficult um, jump from like the current, UI of Facebook. And so there's like an in-between where it's like, well, what if we want to push the needle on like just representing things in like a card where you scroll and you have a hamburger bar for more information? Um, Cause like anything that's more than that, I feel like is like immediately confusing for most people because we're like not used to diversity of UIs. Uh, Vincent, there, there's a part of me that agrees. And there's a there's a part of me that's like uh, my my wife is really struggles with computers, and what she keeps saying is, you know, you folks have this visual language. You all know. You all assume everybody knows. <laughs> like, so, so the counterpoint, which is in a way saying in, in the same direction as you, but another way, a different direction. It's like the shared visual language is a shortcut. And if you come from outside, if you're new to computers, if you come from another culture, you arrive and those shortcuts are totally opaque. Uh, so there's the innovation angle, but there's also the assumption of everybody does it that way, it must work. And now, of course, there's the fact that I think UX has degraded tremendously in the past few years. Like there's so much, uh, oh, it has to be neat and clean, and which is wonderful, of course, but I mean, clutter is bad, yes, sure. But that means that a lot of affordances are hidden and you have to hover or discover them in some obscure way. And uh, what early UX gave us about affordance seems to be forgotten. And I think that's criminal. Uh, and, 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 uh, but it's true that affordance, and it, if you have shortcuts that become common in common parallels that's fine but it should not be an excuse to um how should i put it to hide things or do these less uh explicit things because oh we have this assumed shared vocabulary but uh, yeah when you're innovating you have even much more of a burden on uh, making your interface discoverable. And I think discoverability, again, was an old UX principle. That's absolutely essential. Being able to say, oh, sometimes I do this thing and oh, it changes this thing. So maybe this is an indicator in that and maybe this can act on that. So having these visual feedbacks that tell you uh, my action acts on this indicator and is the indicator also in affordance. And that's very important when you're talking about UX discoverability for people who are discovering whether it's a familiar or unfamiliar, you know, standard or non-standard UX. Over.
Wendy, go ahead. You sure? So thanks. So for me, it's it's I'm trying to collect my thoughts. U, UX, UI design, a development in and of itself, I think we could argue has come, or innovation has come from companies whose primary goal is to sell advertising, right? So the, the design has also evolved to some degree to that purpose, not for the purpose of humans using it more easily, unless that serves the purpose of increasing their engagement and getting more eyeballs on the advertising, right? So I know this is a gross generalization, but I'm just using that to say they're, they're, they're not interested in making necessarily making something that um, works well for the person or helps them find what they're looking for, what they need, or helps match them up with a good real match for them. When I was talking to a, a, a young woman who um, is in data analysis, and she's working for a company that um, helps people find jobs. And she was just expressing um, privately that she was very frustrated. Bye. She was very frustrated with the um, um, with being told that she had to design the her user interface to be to to give a result that had more to do with the jobs they wanted to push on people than the jobs that matched for people. Right. And so to me, this is right. This is the kind of stuff that ends up to your point, Mark Antoine, like, like degrading the UI UX, because then people are frustrated. I searched for this and I got this, like, how did I get this? Right. And so it's part of their ends up being part of their experience, even though I think anyone pulling it out of that context wouldn't, wouldn't want that. Right. So I think some of it is the actual features, the colors, the 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 view on the page and all those things but some of it is also almost purposefully embedded to direct people in a way that they the company wants them to be directed so for me there's a huge opportunity that comes with saying what if we made something else the goal and how what would design look like and how would we make it flow and what what would happen well, next what we're seeing in chat is this is absolutely true wendy and i agree totally but this is a recent development from my point of view as an old curmudgeon in a sense that early ux work like uh, i mentioned apple and peter mentioned amiga it's like it was the machine builders wanted their machines to be usable and so they were looking at their audience not at and yeah when the uh target audience is not the user and that's what advertising is right you have a, <laughs> the, the disconnect between the uh who the interface is for uh, who for whose benefit is the interface built for and who will use the interface when those are disjoint you're in deep trouble but yes, it's it's a very real recent trend, and you're right to point out about it. I would, to it. I would say it's like seven years. Is that feel recent? And I mean, for me in technology, that's a long time ago now, right? From a technological advancement point of view, <laughs> I feel like I've been inundated with so many platforms that now I'm required to learn and figure out how to navigate that have added all this phantom work. And now we're back to another conversation. I, I think this group has had, you know, but a long time ago, back to kind of phantom work that now I have to do that used to be centered around someone else or someone that was paid to do it or whatever, right? Like it also gets into all that stuff. Yeah, um, I've been programming for 40 years. So I have a bit of a <laughs> slightly longer. <laughs> but, but when it's true, time-wise, but when we're talking about the innovation curve, so yeah. much has happened in that seven years that it's to true. me, the, 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 it's true. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, it's also true. The there's now a chasm between what was seven years ago and what is now, right? To me, that absolutely correct. feels huge. Yes, it is huge. No question. Bill? Yeah, so one, I want to thank Vincent for the counterpoint. I've heard this from a younger friend of mine who's an architect and um, so I will say I'm older. It does take me longer to um, sometimes uh, make some adjustments. I mean, literally. Um, so, but I do agree that there is some 
thing that is required of humans in the 21st century to try and make good use of technology. So as my German friend, he said, yeah, well, just grow up and get over it. It's the 21st century, learn how to use the damn computer. And I'm like, I hear what you're saying. I didn't like the way you said it, but there's a grain of truth there. And for Vincent, I think it's true that something new is gonna, you know, I think what we need to do for all of ours is just, this happened years ago, but like, you know, if I'm having trouble with the computer, I have to tell myself, Bill, it's not because you're incompetent, it's because this, this, there's some, you know, friction or breakdown between the design of this thing and how you are trying to use it. So I think we have to give ourselves some help in order to support what Vincent needs is like, let's not just hung up on the three different ways to do stuff. Let's actually, you know, do some real discovery. I don't know if it's good that we wandered into a topic that I'm interested in or not, <laughs> or, or feel like I could talk about it. <laughs> um, I'm actually super interested in, in graph networks and, and uh, things like hyperknowledge and stuff like that, because I want to use it. But this one, HCI, is, is where I've lived for 40 years or whatever. So, um, I, so, one of my, I, so I wanted to make a couple, I add a couple, uh, uh, add a couple things. One of them is, not only are some people good at interfaces or, or know the visual lingo or whatever, um, I think that it's also, there's a class of people and you're looking at a lot of them who are good at, at the meta version of that. It's like, oh, I see something I don't understand. And I, I suspect that there's a system here that I can de deconstruct and reconstruct a model of in my head. And that's something that we do that most people don't do. I think most people look at something arcane and they go, okay, this is just noise and it's not interesting or it's boring or it's poorly constructed or it's meant for somebody else, not me. Um, and so they don't, they don't have that thing. And it's probably, I, I would guess that it's kind of a genetic predisposition to be able to go, oh, I'm going to map this rather than, oh, I'm going to throw this away because it's boring and pointless. Um, uh, so there's a capability thing, but on top of that, there's a meta capability that I think, you know, folks like us have a meta capability to, to go into a noisy environment and start looking for a signal and, and try to map it. Um, uh, another thing that's interesting, I think, Wendy, you made a really good point that we're designing interfaces for ad serving. We're also designing interfaces, Amazon designs interfaces for selling material goods. Um, part of that is just the sales part of it um, or the, the attention part of it. Um, part of it is also scale. Um, so um, Google has spent, Google in particular, um, uh, and I think everybody else kind of learned from them, Google has spent a ton of time figuring out how you semi-automatically um, iterate on UX, UI design um, in, you know, at scale, you know, hi, I've got 3 billion users and I need to figure out whether blue or purple or yellow is the right color for, you know, 80% of them or whatever, right? Um, and they do, they've got that down to a science where um, they know how to, you know, make almost algorithmically make a bunch of, um, a bunch of alternatives and then test them with small parts of the popula their user population, right? They've actually taken <clears throat> a lot of the art, art out of UX design and just turn it into statistical science. And, you know, maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's not. Maybe I would rather have Johnny Ives doing all of my, you know, UI work. Maybe I wouldn't, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's a significantly different thing to do that in a statistical manner rather than an artistic or even an engineering manner. And that's a thing that's different now too. Um, I had one more in there and I wonder if I can tease it out. Um, and I can't. hundred uh, percent on, on everything you're saying and, and you know, in the chat, Vincent was asking, is the modern state the best? And I said, well, it's a 
local optimum. And A-B testing, as you point out, is a great way to get at a local optimum. But a local optimum does not guarantee that there's no space for major innovations that would get us out of the current valley. And the local optimum, according to many constraints, including finding a common familiar thing, including differentiating yourself visually, including all kinds of weird constraints, sales, uh, as Wendy was pointing out. And it's, it's in those constraints may shift and, and, and give rise to new optimums. But it's true where, where I think Bill was making a perfectly valid point is when you're experimenting, you're taking a risk. You're taking a risk that some people who are familiar with something and don't want to think about your interface. And if they don't perceive immediately the benefit of your tool, it's like, why would I spend the cognitive load to learn a new way of doing things? Because it's a cognitive load. There's no question about that. And it's it's something I'm keenly aware of because I also want to innovate a lot on UX designs, but I'm also aware that there's a huge cost to that in terms of adoption. Yeah, I like the um, local optimum turn. Like, I think um, I was referencing some of my thoughts from this article, uh, The Vanishing Designer. Um, and I highlighted this one point, losing the design diversity means failing into a singular narrative of how design must be done. And that's what I have a problem with is that like Google's like, this is the best way to do this one type of design, but there's also other like, <laughs> right? So it's like, yeah, hyper optimizing this one area, but like, what if you need a new, um, a new paradigm? So it's saying like the true opportunity cost is the diverse future that humanity can no longer access um because there's like a self-reinforcing advantage for like everyone just following google's pattern because then people will get whoever copies that pattern immediately and so like my like trove will like work much better if i copy google um it will get more people bouncing from the site if i try to do something different so you're kind of pu punished for um trying to like get like climb out of the local optimum <laughs> Yeah, I guess, um, yes, I agree. Um, that paper, though, was very interesting to me because it was talking about design and with the way we do design, not that there's the end up design of the interface. That's how I read that, what you were reading. So it's a different, it's addressing a slightly different problem, which is the, you know, the, the theory and practice and, um, you know, theory and practice of design of what we're trying to do now, which may be, I, I read that just a little abstract as being, well, maybe we need to really think a little more about how we actually do the work, the reflective practitioners of the design work. And maybe then we'll produce a design you know, for the gray haired Bill Anderson, then he's not going to go, oh my God, really? Again? <laughs> so um, that's how I read, that's why that link sounded really interesting to me. Because it's not just about what I see on my screen, it's about how did that get there to look like that? And how might, you know, you, Vincent, do something different to come up with, uh, whoa, this screen looks really good. It, 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 uh... Sorry, Wendy. Or... Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll just jump in here. Um, the, the interesting thing to me is, is this is not a new kind of business question, right? In the sense that you have Starbucks. I know of a story where the owner of Starbucks came to a head with, am I going to make more profit or am I going to do what's right for my employees? And he wanted to do what was right for his employees. And all his advisors said, you're insane. It's going to sink Starbucks. He did what was right for his employees. And actually the company did better, right? These are the interesting kind of case studies, right? That people will point to and go, oh, we got lucky, right? But then the truth is, you know, there's a lot of decisions made big and small like this in companies all the time, right? So when the priorities hit up against each other, which they naturally will, of are we going to design for the way people think, or are we going to design for what's most common right now? And those two things conflict with each other. 
I, I'm saying, you know, it's a balance. Every company, every person, every experience need deserves, and I think there's arguments to be made for for a balance there. It's not that one is better than another, but right now we're so skewed in one direction, right? That it makes it we're neglecting the design that's good for humans, which I would argue goes into the realm of putting humans into a place where they're in flow state, right? So where it's, what's the edge of my thinking? What's the question I'm asking now? And can I get that question answered relatively quickly so that I can move on to the next question and answer that relatively quickly? And if I can get into that state and stay there for a while, now I'm starting to be in a place where I am getting into creative space or starting to really get into a, a space where I'm using my time super efficiently. I'm super engaged. I'm incredibly motivated. We are becoming a society that's that's having less and less experience with that. And it's coming out and people, out, kids don't spend enough time in nature just playing. I mean, it literally comes out in things like that in articles like that, as much as it comes out in uh, companies dying for for graduates to be coming to them with op more open ways of thinking and problem solving, right? It's every all of the stuff to me is a reflection of we've forgotten how to play with information, and so to me, all this friction, whether it's in the way an app is used through its UX UI design or its um, you know, how slow something renders or how many hoops I have to jump through in order to sign up or how many ads you're going to show me. All these things are, or the rabbit hole I just went down and got lost in for 45 minutes and just came out of and went, wow, I just wasted 45 minutes on that, right? It's all of those things are hindrances to us being in this place where, where we are at our best um, and doing our best thinking. I got to run really quickly. So if, are you going to, I'd love to hear what the um, market term would have to say. So, but no, no, it's, it's, it's just a small thing, really. Uh, it's when you speak about flow, the problem is one of the big hindrances and frictions, unfortunately, is learning how something works. I mean, the, uh, before you started speaking about that, what I was going to say is I remember, unfortunately, how much you know, a lot of people say Apple stole a lot of ideas from Xerox, and they did, but they also perfected them to a huge degree. And the reason uh, I remember the early, like when the Mac first came out, one thing that was so right is the fact that a few of the common keys were universal across all apps. And I could see how new common keys for new gestures became universal and adopted. And at first it was a jumble and people were using different keys for the same action, which had not yet been standardized by Apple, but the landscape uh, converged on certain things. And then you could start using these keys from muscle memory. And that's when you can have flow. It's because you don't have to think about how, how will I do this? It's just blah, 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 and I've done it. And developing muscle memory takes time. And you, if you have to do it every time you switch applications, you're in trouble. So that's the push for standardization that Vincent was beginning to, but the, meaning designing for flow is also designing for follow the herd. <laughs> but sometimes you can, and I remember somebody speaking about, you know, how many innovation tokens you have when you launch a product. And I think this is exactly it. If you're going to do something really innovative in UX terms, and I do totally believe it's still valuable and useful to do so, make sure that you don't do too many innovative things and that the familiar actions are still accessible in familiar ways, because you're just Helping your users achieve flow. That's all I had to say about this. Over. I gotta go. This is a great follow up on what you all talk about. Super. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. I'm gonna head out in about five minutes. Uh, Mark Antoine, you were muted, so we didn't quite hear what you said. No, I'm just saying I'll also need to get going soon. So I wonder if we've shrunk enough that we should fold the tent and speak again later. OK. Or if we have any last last thoughts to wedge in. There's this cool um, Instagram. Well, I follow a few Instagram people that do like um, these sort of like basically design 
um, UI design kind of posts and they're pretty cool. Like these are like all the most common ways to like do a main top bar or like the most common ways to do like text fields. So it's like, hey, there's eight options. If you use something that's not eight of the, one of these eight, you're probably gonna confuse the hell out of people. Um, and they're really helpful um, for me yeah, to be like, okay, yeah. And maybe you should also not mix these in the same form and like, you know, trying to like stick to the kind of standards. But I, most of my Instagram now is just UI UX stuff. Apparently that's what Instagram thinks I am. Um, but yeah, if you guys think any of these are cool, I have lots of them, um, like different types of, of icons. Show, show me the form one again, because I have a strong opinion on this one. And it's so interesting to me that, oh God, this is so wrong. This, okay, these, this is default. The default text can be gray, uh, but I think it's really important that we don't see the text. We don't see yeah. what happens when there is input text. And it's so important that the input text be more prominent than the field name. And that way I love number five because putting the field name in the same color as the field boundary makes it very clear that it is Chrome and not content. Yeah, yeah. In a way that none of the other have. And oh my God, this is brilliant. Uh, you so want to make sure that your field name does not look like content. And five is the only one that nails it. Sorry. Vincent, if you haven't yet. bumped into Chris Messina um, and his, he, he's been collecting UI stuff for years and years. Oh, really? His, his nick is uh, Factory Joe, and he's been posting on his Flickr feed for, for probably, I don't know, 20 years, 10 years, 15 years. I feel like he collects a lot of things. Um, he collects a lot of things, and he does a lot of product hunting and stuff like that. But um, he's he's always had a focus on UI stuff. He's he's been doing UI for since you know uh, two thousand three or something like that. You said it's um. Is there a name for the, the feed? Or... Uh, I put it in the chat. I think this is it. Factory Flickr. Joe. Yeah, Flickr Factory Joe. Yep. Hmm. Cool. Um, I, he's, it looks like he's not really using uh, tags, unfortunately. He just dumps stuff in there, but. <laughs> yeah. Cool, I'll check this out too. I'll put that, um, I'll put that Instagram handle if anyone wants it too. Yeah, thanks. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Talk to you guys soon. Let me save the chat. Um, Pete, um, is it okay that I change the settings for the Zoom? Do you mind? Yeah, the no, options? that's fine. Okay. Cool. Cheers. Zoom has way too many options. Talking <laughs> why, but that's for another thing. <laughs> Wendy, I'll see you in a little bit.